Welcome back everyone to Red Spotlight. I'm Alexis and I'm joined by David, of course, here for our Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. reaction and commentary series that we have been doing now since April of earlier this year. We're now in September and we're now going to approach the end of the first season, the first of seven seasons. So we're only just getting started, but we're also literally at the end of the beginning, if you can imagine that. Today, we're going to react and commentate to episode 21, Ragtag. Of course, our show here is really catered to the longtime S.H.I.E.L.D. fan that wants to come back and discuss the show uh, with people who have also watched the show for various times over. And I find that, and as we've been saying now for literally 20 weeks, uh, really exhilarating to just go back and um, relive the show and talk about all the different uh, uh, points, major and minor, uh, that happen, and a lot happens in every single episode that we can uh, praise and maybe even criticize, of course. Uh, again, not necessarily catered so much so to first-time watchers. First-time watchers, by the way, have a plethora of options available to them on YouTube if you want to have someone to watch it along to. Uh, I, yeah, I think there's a sizable amount of people who actually watch reactions uh, with reactors on YouTube that haven't already seen it, which is interesting. Usually when, and I love reaction channels and I usually, uh, I watch it first myself and then I go and watch it with somebody else on YouTube. That's how I do things. But I'm sure a lot of people do it for the first time. And I just want to be fair to you guys. If you choose us, I mean, we're happy to have you, but there may be, uh, and no, I, there will be probably a lot to spoil. So that that's the thing. It's like sometimes, like for example, there, there's a deleted scene that happens at the end of the, the next episode that is actually going to be reused for season five. And that's going to give away a lot of major plot points. Mm. So we don't want to like, uh, you know, run the risk of you spoiling yourself in that direction. But again, if you want to be here, that's your choice. We're not going to stop you. Uh, and then, of course, as always, for all the people who have been watching and want to have their say, uh, nobody's stopping you. And don't ever get the idea that we're, like, not in the mood to read or talk about any of the things you want to commentate on because... Uh, and as we're about to find out, there are some interesting discussion topics that we can get into. And of course, uh, there will be moments in which we're not going to see eye to eye, and that's perfectly fine. Um, you can tell I, <laughs> I'm laying the groundwork for a certain comment, which is fine, of course. Anybody is f free to have their point of view here, and uh, all voices are going to be heard, of course. Um, now, it's... It, I, I just... I, I'm... A little bit amazed to feel to think right and feel that we're already at episode 21 that's crazy uh so this is as i've already been mentioning various times the 21st episode it is called ragtag and it was written by jeffrey bell who was one of the eps and directors uh and one of the, the kind of the brain trust of the show when you think of agents of shield everyone thinks of uh you know jedmo you know whedon and tanta rowan Everyone thinks of Jeff Loeb or, or maybe even Joss Whedon. Um, but also a key member of that brain trust is also Jeffrey Bell. I personally think it's, you know, the, the top four people in, in terms of uh, the show and the brain trust. And, and by the way, I, I, and I don't know all the names of the writer's room, but the writer writer's room is equally, if not even more important than the people who I'm about to mention. Because they're the ones who actually put the damn things to words. And that that's a hell of a job for sure. Uh, so, and, and there's a lot of names to, to, uh, and, and some of them we have been naming as, uh, as far as the individual episodes are concerned, but there, as the show goes like shield, they had a dedicated writer's room. And so we should not forget their contributions, which are perhaps the most consequential because it is the writing. It is the most important part, but of course the faces, uh, for the people who are the brain trust of the show, Jeffrey Bell is maybe the one who is kind of forgotten about in this sense, but he is so, so pivotal to what makes the show the show. So he did write this episode, and it was also directed by Roxanne Dawson. It was broadcast on May 6th, wow, May 6th, 2014, uh, to 5.37 million viewers. Um, 
I will say not much trivia in the way of the sh- of the episode as of yet, except for the fact that it's interesting. It it did give us Shield viewers a taste of what to expect for the following many years of the show because I. <laughs> For most shows to not know if they were going to come back next year or not, when they air their 21st out of 22 episodes, <laughs> I mean, that's, you mean, you, you get the jitters. It's like, oh, what's going to happen here? Are we going to continue to exist or are we going to get pulled? You know, we're going to get the, the hook, basically, as they would say. Um, and... Yeah, uh, we all definitely felt that it, we lived it in real time, like watching the ramp up to this first season and, and remembering how good it was and then still kind of being in disbelief that people weren't coming back and that there was a serious risk of the show being canceled. And then you also got to keep in mind this as well. When you go back and relive 2013 and 2014 and, and yes, the MCU is beginning to flourish and there's all this positivity, and quite frankly, I miss the positivity. There's so much negativity these days, but back then, there was so much positivity as far as fandom is concerned, except, of course, in our own little corner, in our own, our own little world of S.H.I.E.L.D., there was a lot of put-downs by a lot of our fellow, I guess, Marvel fans or comic fans or whatever, movie fans, even, if you want to call that. And so, you could, it was just kind of, difficult in in points to feel hopeful because there was a lot of negativity and a lot of bashing going on about this show and a lot of the circles uh that we would go and listen to i haven't been i know that dennis zan and david uh God, david griffin from collider amc i think were they amc or collider in those days they, they think they had barely transitioned to, to collider but they were doing reviews for every episode of the season and i'm sure because they were obligated to but those went away after season one and we talked about this at length that after i feel like every season as it goes on there were plenty of uh, people who were in those circles who just dropped off and so yeah it can be it, it was in those moments pretty difficult to be positive about all of uh the future of the show when there's so much bad mouthing going on about it, you know, I mean, again, in that moment. And I'm not even sure. I, I think we did get the announcement of a renewal hours before they aired episode 22, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. So I, I'll, I'll look it up and we'll, we'll, we'll confirm with that next week. Uh, but that's pretty interesting. And I think, and I also wanted to clarify, of course, that would be something that would be hung over our heads for the remainder of the show's, I mean, survival. I mean, and it got the the most sense of direness was season five. At the end of season five, we went in, I think, we were going in, again, the same thing, like hours into before they air the 22nd episode, the finale of season five, and no one knew <laughs> what was happening ABC didn't even know what was happening because that was the they had saved Shield because they were indecisive about what to do with the show. Would they bring it back? Would they not? And again, the show had, by some sheer miracle, continued to exist even though they kept cutting the budget every year. And I guess you could consider that they would cut it again. That was the only way it would be brought back is if, if they were to cut it. And how do you cut it? You cut the season in half. You take... 22 episodes and you make them into 13 episodes and that's how it was brought back but um it was and then i'm, I'm not even sure what to believe like the reports were, were were conflicting there were some articles that were running with the idea that bob Iger personally saved the show because he felt that the the marvel brand needed a presence on abc i don't know how true that is but that's one of the popular um ideas going around um but everyone thought when that happened that was it but then ABC ordered two more seasons. It, it, it's hard to figure out. Anyway, putting that to the side. Um, yeah, this is going to be a big one. David, before we get into the to obviously this week's episodes, can we go ahead and read off the comments that were left not on last week, but the week before that, we still had not gotten to that video. We are talking about The Only Light in the Dark, I believe, episode number 19. Is that the one that we're... Uh, yep. Go ahead. Okay. First one's by Silva Surfa. Uh, greetings, my fellow agents. Hope this finds you well. 
As the LG comic book nerd here, I absolutely love the revelation that Trip is the grandson of Gabe Jones, Howling Commando, and the first African American hero of Marvel Comics who debuted hey. in 1963. I had no idea. That's some really cool history there. Yeah. Uh, that leads to my view of the AOS's woke comment, which I disagree with. AOS is diverse without pandering and without being forced, which is the key difference between the modern debate on what woke entertainment is today, in my opinion. Trip was quickly my favorite character at this point, and I was all aboard the Trimmins ship train until the <laughs> season one finale. Always enjoyed both of your commentary and appreciate you two do for doing the show. <laughs> and I appreciate you so much for that for that comment and for you continuing to uh, to watch with us and to uh, chime in with how you feel. Um, I mean, definitely, we we love that. Uh, and as far as like Trip is concerned, man, I I, I feel sorry <laughs> in terms of like you know Trip. Oh, gee, Trip is a great character, but I, I I think a lot of people feel like he wasn't treated the best, and, I'm, and maybe Silva Surfa maybe is of that mind. And then of course to be a Trimmins ship, oh man, mm. oh man, what a short lived era. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, what a short lived era. Mm. But hey, we all got our we all got our ships for sure. I mean, at least Silva got over it by. Before the beginning of season two, though, because <laughs> if it was still like, no, nah, they got something going on here in season two, then it's just like, oh, no. <laughs> nah, I mean, I feel like personally, I don't ever feel there was ever any kind of intent for the Trimmins thing to happen. But I feel like if you were a Trimmins person, I feel like the whole big sequence at the bottom of the ocean should have put that to bed. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, they kept it open. Fitzsimmons didn't become a couple until like halfway through the third, maybe even toward the end of the third season. It mm -hmm. took a while to get there. But I mean, I feel like it was pretty telegraphed where it was going to go. I don't think it was anything. But again, uh, that, to each their own, of course. Um, the I think the, the central comment here is in the middle of that paragraph. Uh, David... Would you like to take the first stab at that one? Because um, I, I, I did say that. I, I'm, I'm the one that made the comment about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as woke. Um, it's pretty interesting. We had a, a conversation about this particular issue just a number of days ago on the main Red Spotlight podcast with our, our friend uh, Peter Martinez. Um, having this exact same conversation about uh, woke and how people – uh, have kind of like used the word. Uh, my personal perspective, taking a step back, it, I feel it's very unfortunate the way that that word has been ingrained in our culture. I find it very unfortunate that um, a whole term was basically created to single out and demean uh, creators uh, for trying to expand the realm of what it means to be represented on screen and include and, and to just be more inclusive, right? I, I find it really, really disturbing that people, and what I mean by people, I, I should say not normal people, like any of the people who are commenting on our on our videos. I just mean like generally speaking, that word has been made uh, a, a bell whistle a, a dog whistle if you will uh it's like red meat for people and then and people are triggered and they're angry and i i'm not saying by the way that um there aren't legitimate criticisms to be made of pieces of art where the political uh elements or the main idea of what is trying to be communicated uh i'm not trying to say that can't be criticized because mm -hmm. it obviously can and we have in 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 various instances um so just to put that to bed and i'm also i want to be very clear and direct about this i am not referring to silva surfa as an individual that is seeking to demean uh creators for creating mm -hmm. more inclusive parts in hollywood uh, mm -hmm. or in in the show i want to be very direct and clear at the very top that's not what we're talking about yeah but uh, there is going to be some nuance to this particular uh comment about yeah. agents of shield is woke yeah david well, you wanted to chime in here's the thing 
I'll use the acolyte as like an example. Oh yeah. The reason a, why I'm that's so that's a buzzword confused. right now. The acolyte. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's the thing: if people who hate the acolyte, they keep calling it a woke show and everything. And the reason why I'm confused about it is because I go, okay. Usually, when you use woke, it's because they change the ethnicity, race, or gen or gender of a curtain that's always of a character that's already been established. Okay. Well, so David, that's how it used to be, but now it, now I feel it's been changed oh. to now where you include any person of color. Now you're all of yeah, a sudden woke, that's, right? That's the thing, though. I mean, I, I know they're always com- people just throw it out there, basically, and all that. They even throw it out there that, uh, um, you know. What is it? Strong women is what they say whenever there's a f- strong <laughs> female lead and something. I forgot about that. And, like, um, and you know, and even the people who say that they they get annoyed sometimes too when people point it out. It's like, no, this is actually a good <laughs> character, female character. Like can you guys the MCU. Chill it out? <laughs> yeah. And so, for me specifically, I would say something is woke when it does that, when it changes race, ethnicity, gender of an established character. Do what so I that's that how bad? you define woke. Yeah, you so. define woke, and to be very clear about that, when they take, for example, wasn't in some, we're going to use the comics here. I believe there were some iterations where Nick Fury originally was a white character, right? Mm-hmm. And instead they cast uh, Samuel L. Jackson in the films. So by that, using that as an example, you find that to be woke correct uh nick fury it's kind of iffy because yes he used to be white in the comics but then later on was black and and so they stuck with oh, that with the I movie see. so i don't okay. know it's, not, okay. it's it's hard to say but i mean there are so your example is it okay that mean not that's not a great example because there is uh in the comics that had that change had already been made but let me just stop you there the idea though let's just keep it to the comics the fact that nick fury's race was changed from white to black just in the comics why was that choice made also would that not be considered woke yeah that would be considered woke and now okay when something like that happens do i find it bad no it can be good does i don't really care i oh one example i can't use not comic books but percy jackson um uh, they changed the ethnicity a couple of characters and all that um i had no problem with it and i'm a huge fan of it so something with that, it can work. With Shield, though, I wouldn't consider. Wait a minute. There's one more interesting. In- this is a more interesting example of it. I know. In remember the recent uh, Spielberg film West Side Story, uh, in what the story back in the '60s. There's this is character that's in the Jets that is called. I, think, I believe their name is their names is anybody, anybody's. Um, and in 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 the 1960 film and the Broadway version, it's supposed to be. A girl that's a tomboy uh, that wants to be a part of the boys of the Jets, but in the Spielberg film, I believe it's actually a trans man. The the the, mm-hmm. the actor, I should say. Yeah. Okay. Um. It, so again, I'm not sure the character is being changed there, but what is definitely a a choice that was made is they they changed the role that on paper was not intended to be played by a trans actor. And they saw an opportunity to, to cast a trans actor. Mm-hmm. I think that also fits the same line of thinking as woke, yeah. correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And like I said, like when, when a movie or show does that, it's not really a problem for me. Um, the show can still be good, whatever. Uh, but the thing, though, is that you can't deny with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., though, is that it is being diverse, inclusive. They are taking into consideration... You know, okay, we have this character. Um, that's just—I don't know how they, how the, uh, fuck, um, how they got the actors, how they chose them, and everything. But like, again, you can't deny it that they were trying to make a diverse cast of characters um, with this show. So, with something like that, can't deny it, and it's a good show. And so, when you put in that effort, it doesn't mean that, you know, when you, when you are kind of focusing on making a diverse cast it doesn't mean that's going to be bad or that that's all they're focusing on like no they're putting in the effort (laughs) of making this a good show but also keeping in mind like hey let's bring in some different people here and so that's the thing with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. like I said I wouldn't consider it woke because most of these characters are original 
Uh, I would say the only one really is Daisy that's from the comics. Um, yeah, pretty much everyone else is just original. So, right. but, but all you can say for sure is that it is being diverse. It is trying to be inclusive. And uh-huh. that's one thing. That's another. It's basically whatever we're diverse, inclusive, woke people who we don't like on the internet will use that as a way to say, oh, that means that this show is not going to be that good because that's all they're focusing on or that's all they care about. They care about trying to get the million likes on Twitter and everything. Like, that's always their excuse. So, whatever you want to say about it, either way, um, they're, they're trying. <laughs> it's really a lot. Mm-hmm. I, I called Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. woke only because of what we just talked about, which was there are people nowadays who take it so far to the point that if you just straight up hire anyone that's not a straight white male, then somehow that means you're woke. Mm -hmm. So I'm just using the logic or the latest version of that logic. Understanding, of course, that that kind of rationale is flawed in and of itself because many people use that term very differently and under very different circumstances, Mm -hmm. I should say. Uh, it, yes. Well, I was gonna say I forgot to mention. This is why I brought up the acolyte. It's because they were calling that show woke, and that's why I was so confused. <clears throat> it's like, okay, why? These are all original characters. Um, they brought in some established ones. You know, like uh, that one shot of fucking Yoda. No, no, Palpatine's master. Um, oh, uh, Darth Plagueis. Plagueis. Yeah, like they. That's all they did, but it was just like one little shot. They didn't get any lines, but you know, like I said, these are all original characters. This is all. This is an original story. That's so, not a woke problem. That's a Star Wars problem. Yeah, I mean, it's just, but, that's that's. <laughs> so I don't understand why you would call this woke. I mean, and like, and I mentioned in our last podcast, I didn't like the show. <laughs> I thought I found it boring right. and everything, but not because of woke reasons or anything like that. But that's... you're saying you didn't like the show because you had issues with. A lot of reasons I had nothing at all to do with uh, how the cast looked like Mm -hmm. or what they identified as, right? That's basically what the issue is and what it's become for many individuals. Again, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to me is one of the most diverse shows of its time. I mean, the, the fact that you have like two particularly Asian female leads is kind of astonishing for a show of this caliber. Uh, you know, the Asian community specifically, uh, they've had it the hardest among, you know, as far as like representation is concerned, uh, or not maybe the single hardest, but among the harder ones to get any kind of representation on screen. And you know what? I feel like recently at the most recent Emmy Awards that happened uh, about a week and a half ago, John Leguizamo was brought on stage and he had a really powerful presentation about, or I should say maybe just the power, powerful statements that were made. Uh, they had given out, oh God, I think they were they were honoring, oh yeah, they were honoring Greg Berlanti. He received an award because of, uh, I guess, uh, he ha- he is an LGBT uh, person and he has made it big and I feel like he's, I think the award was like, he's used his platform to promote different kinds of voices out there. But John Leguizamo brought up I think what really is at the heart of the debate is that when he grew up, a person that looked like him can only be seen through all of the stereotypical lenses, and that it meant a lot to him that now, as a middle-aged adult, there were a lot more roles opening up for people that looked like him, and in just that night, uh, I forget her name, but what's her face in the bear who happens to be Latina, won for best actress in a comedy or whatever, or comedy in quotation marks, I should say. It's not a real comedy. Um, But I feel like people who don't understand why representation matters should go look at that. And you get the sincerity in what he is saying. And to me, I thought it was a really special component of S.H.I.E.L.D. that it was so diverse. That was my first thing about why I was saying that it was woke. Second... Woke usually refers to progressive politics. Now, that's not how it's determined by people. When you when people use woke, it's just a blanket statement for bad. 
and people use it without thought. Now, those who have put more thought into it would use woke as an example of it's using this platform to enhance political messaging and that is prioritized over the storytelling and because that happens the end product ends up being flawed and diminished and so i agree in the end i believe the way that silva surfa is using the word is that shield was not hindered in any way why well, well they're saying that it's not woke because it's not shield wasn't like ruined or shield wasn't like affected or Sylvester for maybe is saying that well the show never came at, at at the consequence of them trying to put in any kind of political messaging and there are a lot of very complicated opinions about this but I just personally feel that um I if I don't like something it's the writing and the messaging I don't know how many times it the message is the problem and more so it's just the talent behind the screen hmm. you know um one of the more famous recent episodes of Doctor Who from the last few years and tch, maybe I, I made a mistake opening up that can of worms with Doctor Who cuz that's a whole I mean the fact that people were even going after Doctor Who for being political I just find that so dull and so dumb because that show literally was always political but okay you whatever but one of the ones that most fans find to be quite a bad episode of the show was Jodie Whittaker uh Orphan 55 or whatever it was they went to that planet and it ended up being Earth it was kind of like Planet of the Apes a little bit um but people were attacking it because it felt like at the end of the episode, the whole show stopped and the doctor looked at the camera and like said the message out loud. And I believe uh, Vera from uh, the Geeks, no, not the, the Council of Geeks YouTube channel had a great review of this one. And she can tell you herself um, better than I could. But the problem with that was not the message the problem was how it was communicated i i think to a certain extent silver surfer agrees with that and yes i don't think there was ever an instance where shield stopped to throw out the message of the story but when i say woke i use it in the sense of progressive politics because i know that the political right the alt right and the conservative right wing uh, apparatus aligned with um, these grifters on YouTube who are there to rob you blind and throw rage and anger out there and to distract from the real problems. They want to keep this thing going uh, for a lot of nefarious reasons. For one, they want to get they want to make money off of it, and if they happen to uh, block different kinds of people from getting any kind of recognition, that's a bonus for them. But it's been put out there and we're at this place where uh, a lot of people in fandom are believing Disney is failing, Star Wars is failing, Marvel is failing because they decided to prioritize representation and people of color over being mainstream. And I feel like if you feel that way, I don't think you have for one single second considered something else over here that you're not paying attention to. And that is called the filmmaking process. And if you look behind the curtain at Disney and how they run things, you can see crystal clear what is wrong with their filmmaking process. And the message ain't got shit to do with it. And by the way, some executives just the other day pretty much told on themselves they're the least thing there's like nothing woke about them when they're telling the the artists or the directors to make characters seem less gay i mean that that doesn't sound like woke to me and by the way most conservatives when they use woke they mean progressive politics they're saying woke as we don't want any politics ever in anything when the reality is of course they mean 
politics that they are opposed to. If it's politics that they agree with, like am I racist or sound of freedom, then they're perfectly fine with that existing. But if it's about something else they don't that they feel singled out, then they'll lash out. That's just how it is. And when I mean conservatives, I mean more so the people who are guiding and steering the conversation. I'm not referring to regular individuals who happen to be co-opted by this message. I'm talking about the people who put it out there to distract, correct? And then this whole other issue, Marvel, Disney, and Star Wars do not allow creatives and they do not allow visionaries or auteurs to come on in here and have a vision. That's the first problem. They only hire people who they can push around and tell what to do. And then, as far as how they make the damn things, they shoot without scripts. And that's even if they hire good people to write the scripts in the first place. Oftentimes, they, they bring in a lot of people they've already worked with who have already proven that they're not great writers. And guess what? Things continue to suck because they're not good at the job at writing. And then they have to reshoot because then they realize, oh, no, it's bad. I got to go fix it. And they spend more money on it. And then the whole thing just ends up being just a mess. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And I don't, I don't understand why we can't focus on that, but we have to spend all of our attention about this one word woke, and we have to fight the term, we have to fight this battle on their terms, and they're winning when we subject ourselves to this idea that woke equals bad. There is, if you mean woke by like just having black people or brown people or gay people, there's nothing wrong with them being included or being on screen or those audiences being catered to first and foremost. If you mean when you say woke that the creatives or the creators are more concerned with the message over the story, I can't honestly name you too many instances where that has been the main reason why something has failed. If something has failed so obviously so, it has less to do with that and more to do with the fact that the people behind the camera just weren't very talented or things went horribly wrong for other reasons. And I just feel like S.H.I.E.L.D. was loud and proud in how I determined Woke to be in the sense that it had a diverse cast of actors and characters. Uh, it, it really catered to a lot of experience. And to me, it was very eclectic because you had a family of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents who came from different parts of the world. And I thought that was really cool because not most shows do that. And it made it feel really natural. Maybe that's why some people don't see it because it was seamless that people from different parts of the world that looked differently became a family of their own and they genuinely loved each other. And it, for me, what I loved about it is that it proved that that can happen. And that not only can it, but it should happen. We should open ourselves to enjoy the company of people who we have, at least on the surface anyway, who we don't think we have all that in common with. We, it's about breaking those barriers. And by the way, if you're making something to break barriers, that's not a bad thing. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but this art form, it being a work of art, is going to be political one way or the other, unless you're actively trying for it not to be political, something political is going to be said because of what you're doing. I mean, when, when we hit season four and all the way to season seven, there are a lot of really hilarious, cheap pot shots made by the writers and nodding and winking at the audience. Fuck Donald Trump and fuck conservatism and fuck fascism. It very and fuck guns. I mean, I don't know how many gun jokes there were made. There was even a joke in season six where they were like, I believe uh, one of the aliens was saying that you know, the, oh, the planet Kitson was this like really disgusting place of <coughs> perversion, and then it cuts to Piper saying he just described Florida. I mean, it's pretty transparent. This isn't anything new. So I just want to say. I feel we waste so much time having these kind of debates um, when we're not focusing on what the real problems are. And by the way, I'm not saying there can't be any issues because of the woke or however you define woke to be. That can maybe perhaps lead to some issues. But 
could they really be compared to the issues happening over here when it comes from the top down? All these problems. Mm -hmm. Disney ultimately need. I, I agree with with the conservatives and the woke mob in the sense that Disney is at fault, but they don't understand the reasons for why Disney is crippling Star Wars and Marvel. Mm -hmm. It's not to do with representation. It's more to do with the fact that they're basically this like this corporation that is so focused on every movie being four quadrant, meaning that it has to be as generic and appeal to the widest audience as possible. And we can't have any kind of auteurism or visionary or statements being made. And when you prohibit that, you make all your things at best cookie cutter. And at some point people are going to realize this isn't hitting. But the problem is people don't want to look at that, but they get captured by the loudest voices in the room who are screaming, you know why it's not as good as it used to be? Because Disney went woke. David. No, yeah. And I, I agree with everything you said, especially with the part with, um, you know, majority of time movies, what the message of the story is the reason why it failed. Let's just say it was the reason, like with the Marvel movies. Let's just say like the, the message was the reason why. It's still a lot of the reason, though, is because of how the movie is made, you know, because like if, <laughs> yeah. I'm go if I'm going into a Marvel movie and they're like, all right, uh, we need you. OK, you're it now. You got to direct this movie or write this movie. Um, well, you got to do it as we're filming. And it's like, oh, OK, um, well, what's the story about? Like, that's the first thing you got to ask. It's like, what's the story? What's yeah. the message? And they, they try to give you all these details. And it's like, sh and then sure, maybe I can come up with like story like that it's like okay we're gonna do this this and this okay we'll maybe work on this and all that and then they come in oh you can't do that because we're gonna add this thing later on in the movies or you can't do that because there's no time in the cg <laughs> there's something like that because they keep this is how they're making these movies and so when you go out of your way saying like oh it's because of the message they're more focused on the message it's like okay sure there's the focus is on the message because that's all they have to focus on. That's all they can work on because of how they're making these movies. That's and a so very good point, David. I hadn't even considered that. It gets so rigid to the point where the only kind of creative expression they used to be able to really imprint their stamp on would be through that way. Mm -hmm. You are correct. And um, like a lot, you, Like John this... Watts, for instance. John Watts, I believe, has made some comments that he felt like he – I think I read I, – I, I'm sorry to cut you off real quick, no, but I was watching Heroes Reforged and they were saying that John Watts had come prepared with his idea of what Spider-Man Homecoming should be. But he realized that Marvel had already decided what the movie should be and he kind of just like went along with that. Just mm -hmm. to give you an example of um, what that looks like, what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But I know this is also why we look at some Marvel movies now. We're kind of like – you're kind of doing like a lot of things at once and <laughs> you kind of – you should have put like cut it down a bit, you know, especially with um, Multiverse of Madness. I remember my biggest complaint was just like I feel like they should have either focused on him letting go of his feelings with Christine or focus on being like an apprentice or, or have uh, America Chavez be his apprentice of sorts, you know, and it's like – you should have just picked one and then go along with it. And then, I mean, there's also many other problems, but like those, but in terms of like what the story was about, that was kind of the two main things. <laughs> and so, and I'm sure we can point out with the other things with the, I mean, with Eternals too, like, you know, that's the only one where like they actually, like, she stuck to her guns and be like, Hey, there's how we're going to make it and all that. But she still had like a whole big story to tell that kind of, was kind of cramped into a two hour movie, which felt like mm -hmm. it could have been like an entire series, you know, even for her. So, yeah, this is when they say, you know, they're focused. By the on way, make sure you best believe I'm going to report your ass to Alexis Moreno. We will not have that <laughs> eternal slander on this. Uh, I, I, hey, look, I, I'm I'm an odd duck. I, I'll I'll put it out there. I'm an Eternals defender, and I, I'm a huge and I'm a, I'm a defender of the Last Jedi as well. And I'm sure many people who are like, oh, he said the thing shouldn't have said oh no look even if you don't like the last jedi hey we're happy to have you i want to be clear about that I, I, a lot of people and i'm guilty of this as well use that as the basis for whether or not to continue listening to somebody speak or not look that's how passionate we get 
But let's be honest with ourselves. One thing, whether you hate it, or hate or love the direction of that movie, speaking to what you said, when I watched the behind the scenes documentary, one of the first things Ryan Johnson did was, you know, get a piece of paper and he wrote down the main characters' names and he asked, who are they? And he used that to base off what the movie was going to be. He needed to know who the characters were first because despite contrary to popular belief, honestly, uh, the, the Force Awakens did not firmly establish, well, much of anything to be real with you, but especially, I mean, it got you the feel of character. Like we liked the characters because of like, there were more personalities, but they weren't fully fledged characters yet. Ryan Johnson had to come into a, a part two of a trilogy and firmly, concretely establish who these people were supposed to be. Now, granted, a lot of people who may be listening are going to be like, but Alexis, he didn't do that. And they're trash and they're garbage and they're so disappointing and nobody likes them. Hey, if that's your opinion, that's your opinion. That's cool. But I'm just saying, where he, the approach where he came from is what used to be commonplace. That used to be the way creatives would come on to a franchise and some of the best ever films and shows were made through that approach and that mentality. And I argue because that approach is not being used. And instead of instead of having character and themes and arcs be at the top of mind, a lot of the times it's not even considered. And we're just straight up just going to story. And how does this further the universe? Or how does this further the brand or the franchise? And that kind of thinking, I personally believe, has led us to the state of ruin where we're at right now. I, it's not a surprise to me the Acolyte wasn't very good. I didn't watch it because at this point I had become so disillusioned with Star Wars. I feel very clearly, um, very strongly, that they don't really have anybody at Lucasfilm that has um, um, any kind of sense as to like what Star Wars needs to be today. Not that uh, fans, by the way, have much better ideas themselves. I want to be clear about that. But I just think there's too much catering to fans. And then you see the reaction. Um, and there's not enough uh, also focus on what makes a good story. And we should also remember, I was even hearing and reading that Dave Filoni had, you know, a lot of notes that he gave to the Acolytes. So again, that's just one more <laughs> strike on his ledger, if you want to put it there. Um, filmmaking and storytelling is a complicated and hard process, but it doesn't need to be this complicated. It doesn't need to be this hard. Like, there was a framework, a book, a playbook on how to make movies and how to treat characters. And that and you could just go back to the, the 80s and the 90s. And they got that down to a T, even the 2000s. But lately, we've just lost ourselves. And instead of focusing on those issues, we're just, we're in the trenches of these like culture wars. And we all lose for that. Nobody wins. While we're all having this like uh, war of identity and culture, the corporations continue to suck us dry. And more importantly, well, maybe not more importantly, but more uh, nefariously, they're continuing to profit off of all of this whilst continuously at the same time, simultaneously, I should say, um, destroying the industry itself. So that's a lot. <laughs> It's a lot. Well, we, we we dedicated this, but I, I felt that this was a this is such a delicate issue, and also it's a, a huge issue to just like leave it out there. And Silva, I I again I appreciate your comment. And um, by the way, I'm not upset at you. I, I look that way because I'm tired. <laughs> I don't know if you could tell it. I'm I'm very tired right now, so it's like um, I I'm very appreciative for the comment, and I, I hope that. Um, you take the stuff that we say um, to heart a little bit. And that I don't say that in like, you're wrong. I'm more, I'm saying, well, I think there's different perspectives out there. And I think sometimes, despite the fact that we may not want to, there can be some good made out of listening to other kinds of voices. Um, 
but then I'm also reminded that 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 term woke, it means very different things to very different people. And that's part of the problem for why people just can't have any kind of consensus on what, where to stand on woke because no one has one single term for what it means. Um, but I also do want to say, and again, Silva, I don't include you in these further comments, but we've also been pretty flat out there that uh, the alt-right um, in America is a nefarious force and it needs to be crushed. And it needs to be said because we're not a political podcast. We don't seek to be a political podcast, but there is a rise of fascist, fasc, 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 fasc light uh, movements. And um, I believe strongly that, that they need to be crushed and swiftly crushed. And we don't need to entertain talking points from people who, first of all, don't even believe what they're saying. They're just saying it out there to make money off of themselves. And they, they profit off, off of people's rage and anger. And I find that, you know, fundamentally despicable. But more to the point, um, political organizations are benefiting. Conservative organizations are benefiting from people being captured by geeks and gamers and all these other people because they're profiting off of hate. And they're creating more hate. And when the more hate you put out there, I mean, uh, I don't know why hate is such a beautiful commodity. And, and, and it's so blatant, you know? Um, some people complain about Killers of the Flower Moon. It's like, Scorsese, what were you trying to say with uh, with that movie? Why didn't you make it a mystery? Like, why are you just saying that? Why are you showing us again and again, you know, uh, these particular individuals, these white people in that film being bad to the Native Americans? Why... And why are you making us feel this way? Because somebody needs to to take us as a society into account for the transgressions that we have committed against our own. And what I mean by our own, I mean our fellow human beings. And it's uncomfortable, and not many people want to discuss that, but it also was very blatant with how evil and easily evil can creep into individuals. Also, Kittles of Flower Moon, that is from my definition, a woke movie because the book that it's based off, the main characters are the, the FBI agents or what are they? Um, detectives, whatever. It, like, if the movie was a true telling of the book, the main character would have been um, Jesse Plemons. Mm -hmm. uh, Meth like, Damon, for those who don't know who Jesse Plemons is. Mm -hmm. Jesse Plemons, uh, yeah, the cowboy FBI agent. He was supposed to be the main character. They changed it completely to center it more on the Osage community. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, look, the main character still is Ernest. And it's still, the main character is still a white figure. But instead well, of using it, instead of a white savior story, it's more of a white guilt story, I guess. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I mean, I say work because his still main focus, though, was on the Native Americans in this story. Like, what they went through and everything. The, that's what it was. Instead of focusing on what the main story was from the book, which is the investigation. <laughs> right, right. It was really, the whole investigation just happened like that compared to the entire movie. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, we, we, we appreciate all comments. Um, and Silva, I, I, I sincerely hope you continue. We said a lot. You feel free to write ten paragraphs if you'd like. Mm -hmm. We would love we would love to hear it. Uh, maybe we won't read the whole ten paragraphs. Maybe a summary of it, but feel free to respond to every little point. Um, I, I encourage you completely to do that. Um, and and to any, anybody else, uh, I apologize if this took up too much time, but I, I sincerely do believe this is such an important issue. Ignoring it, I don't think helps this. We need to talk about this because if we don't talk about it, it just – it's there and if and if it just sits there and it festers, it's not going to get any better. And I sincerely want to be hopeful about things getting better and that's why I, I want to address that issue. All right. I believe we still have comments. Yeah, just <laughs> David. two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> next one was is from Serenity Forever. Uh, Sharon Carter, Emily Van Kemp was the power broker in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. 
Um, I think we might be got her confused or something else, or I don't know. Uh, can't remember. I don't know. Um, it says dark matter was also important in Agent Carter. And then, assuming none of you have seen it, Jedmo wrote some of the best Dollhouse episodes. If you want more, Amy Acker, Ditch. Uh, uh, it's uh, Deacon Lack. I forget Deacon or I think I'm gonna say it's De- Deacon Deacon Lockman. Okay. Deacon Lockman is the actor that plays uh, Daisy's mother, hmm. Jaying, I should say. Oh, okay. Enver Enver obviously plays um, Susa. And then Patton Oswalt, the Koenigs, and Reed Diamond plays uh, Daniel Whitehall. Hmm. A lot of alum <laughs> yeah. from S.H.I.E.L.D. or in Dollhouse, it looks like. So I guess uh, – and by the way, interestingly enough, a lot of individuals in fandom, this, this very thing is what they like to crucify James Gunn for. It's like, why are you working with the same people all over again? You see, in a smaller scale, this happens all the time. It's so ridiculous in that era that we were in that James Gunn was being criticized because he put his wife in everything. Oh my god, he put his wife. However will we go on? <laughs> I mean... Have you ever considered to be... I mean, if you have the opportunity to cast your spouse in something, would you really hesitate? Mm. What kind of a stupid question is that? Come on. It's easy. Okay, next one. And then next one, last one is from Jack Dobbs. Um, yes, strange as, as it may seem, there were people in the fandom who saw the framework version of Ward as a 100% legitimate redemption arc for the real world version. The one that betrayed everyone. Of course, I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to yeah. stop you there. Um, <laughs> that is so complicated. Uh, but then also just kind of, Okay. The ward that we saw in the framework, everybody knows, is not connected at all to the ward that we're seeing right here in season one, and so on and so forth. Everybody agrees with that. Um, I just feel perhaps there's just a huge misunderstanding when Sky Daisy says to ward, framework ward, that meeting you makes me understand him a little bit more i think what she's saying there well she's doing a lot of things first of all in that moment she just feels bad she feels bad that that there is a version of ward that is actually good and that's messing with her because this in an effort another reality ideally this would have been a potential boyfriend of hers and in the framework she she was but she ended up being hydra not him in the framework and so it's really messed up and really weird. And, and she's just trying to navigate that. And, and also she doesn't want to be unkind to this version of Ward who is not at all like the one that, you know, they interacted with. At the same time, because she saw how good of a person he was in the framework, I feel like her comments are, are about him understanding Ward you know, it. it I, I feel like they're they're not like redeeming comments. They're more, they're even more tragic because Sky is saying like he really could have been a good guy, and maybe there was some good in him all along. And maybe all the and I think she's saying is like maybe all those times that he had with us, maybe he wasn't being fake the whole time. Maybe there was a lot of what, how, and I mean the episodes that we just finished watching, 1 through 20, maybe there were moments where he was being genuine, where he was being real, where he was being a human being. Maybe there was good in him all along. Um, and I don't think that's untrue. The problem was is that there was more bad, <laughs> right? And there was clearly <laughs> a lot more bad than there was good. And so every cur- every person is a collection of good things and bad things, you know? And at the end of a life, you have to take into account what weighs heavier, the good or the bad. Uh, but if you if you know Sky and the trauma that she has endured, I mean, and everybody else around her, I mean, it's, it's hard to ever really forgive Ward for what he did, nor should, I think, he ever receive forgiveness. That's not what it was about. It was more so Daisy reconciling with the idea that 
she had a friend and a potential lover that ended up being a Nazi and killed a lot of her friends. And it still somehow is pretty suckish to think that there could have been a version. She sees in the framework war the one that she wanted all along. That's what's really tragic about it. Am I wrong about that? <clears throat> no. Yeah, I agree. 100%. Okay. <laughs> but uh, that, uh, that first part of the comment, well, we'll leave that be. Go ahead with, with what you were saying with that comment. The one that betrayed everyone, then of course most. Of course most of those same people were the instigators of a social media fan campaign to get AOS canceled. Solely because what? the show no longer featured Brett Dalton and Grant Ward. <laughs> oh my god. As for this particular episode, I like bits of it. There's some really fun and interesting character moments marbled throughout the show's run time, but at times it does feel like post Hydra reveal, the writers are holding back the really juicy stuff for season two. <laughs> hey, that's fair. Yeah. But uh, I don't think it stops being entertaining. I th- I th- that's the thing. I-, I feel like... Here's the thing. Uh, turn, turn, turn was the climax of season one. And everything else is falling action. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. So we've already hit the peak. And we're like climbing down the mountain. And then also gearing up to climb it back up in the next season. That's why it feels like for some people that these last couple of episodes are not as good. You can't really be any better than the peak, now can you? That's where I come from. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, that's all of them for episode. Okay. Nine. Thank God. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, please continue to comment, but we need to get to it. And that was more so our fault than anybody else's. All right. Let's go ahead and begin the episode. These vials contain the raw materials of whatever Jesus juice brought Coulson back from the dead. You know what would have been an inner... I mean, this might be like a lazy uh, casting choice, but you imagine if they ever did like a TV Joker and they cast uh, uh, Bill Paxton. <laughs> Uh, he he kind of gives like Jack Nicholson vibes. That yeah, that could work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Ward. My name is John Garrett. I here's a casting issue I've always had with. I've never liked this actor being a younger version of Ward. I don't think he looks anything like him. I don't think he looks anything like brett dalton mm. and to me it's so distracting and by the way that comes from a person who hardly is ever distracted by casting choices but this one's just like uh, i don't see it i don't see it especially because like how much how how old is ward supposed to be in the show like 35 at most mm-hmm. maybe 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 even younger like 30 or 20s like i mean i don't really know myself and and this is supposed to be a teenager mm-hmm. this is, uh, this is like a different individual but that's just me that's just me and then also i'm here to make you a one-time offer so listen up it's always interesting how we how they uh try to make older characters look younger especially on tv and i don't know what it is about it again it's not that different but did, did they dye his hair or give him a wig or like what what happened here like they didn't use any de aging like well, that's a bit too Expensive, I think, for them, right? I don't think S.H.I.E.L.D. ever used de-aging mm. that I know of. I mean, he doesn't look that different. I think there's just like a couple of... like get you out of here and teach you how to be a man. Uh, changes here and there. Ten seconds and I walk out that door. Say yes. It's not really much of a choice. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody move! I told you it was going to be fun. <laughs> The instant gratification that Garrett got from that. Mm -hmm. See, I told you it's going to be fun. I have to expand our search. Guys, you want to come in here for a minute? I love how low tech this is for them, (laughs) but it it, it works. It works. You know? Mm -hmm. It's just about everything we've been dealing with. This is the whole season right here. Yeah. Cybertech built Deathlock, shipped items to Quinn who was working for the clairvoyant, who turned out to be Garrett, who planted Ward on our bus because he wanted to know why I didn't stay dead. That's the whole season in a nutshell. (laughs) I love that visual. Mm -hmm. I'll be damned if I'm gonna let Garrett and Ward get away with murder. And I want my plane back. 
could have crossed off that drug lord without getting my picture taken. Single shot, half a mile away. You're missing the point. I love how Gary just moved in here, and it already, like, it seems like he owns the place. Zeller. Yeah, it's me. Stream Mike Peterson some video of his son this afternoon. That doesn't help. Don't mention it. <laughs> I give him some time with his son at the very least. Right? Like, has he even done that at all? He's like, evil. Well, I don't believe that people are born Ooh. evil. Something must have happened. But people can be made to be evil, right? Isn't there a... Is evil born or is evil made? Welcome to Cybertech. Sit, please. <sighs> Those disguises are hilarious. To be powerful, non-lethal, and to break, the exit. break up under subcutaneous tissue. Isn't that... <laughs> And to break that was <laughs> Yes, but this is an icer. Triple the stopping power and a much cooler name. Oh. Well, uh, Colson just like stopped like really fits name. I mean, what do you do? <laughs> Do the flips actually made her go faster, or did she just... Was it just for the trying to get it to kick? The answer home? is she's May, and it was cool. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> People with gifts. I'm waiting for what's inside to be revealed. I wonder what she's talking about. <laughs> the girl, Sky. What do you know about her? She's already putting the pieces together about who she is. I believe she and I have something in common. So at this point, Reyna has a pretty good idea that she is Cal's daughter. The one that he would always talk about. Mm -hmm. The one that was stolen from him. Sky, Trip, get ready for a large file transfer. How large? <laughs> that has to be one of the funniest moments in the whole show. Mm -hmm. um, get ready for a large file transfer. Sky's on her laptop, like, getting ready. Okay, yeah. how large? Then out of nowhere... <laughs> And the fucking file cabinet just like falls out of the damn building. I mean, now I remember when I first watched that, David, for the first time I was like cackling. Mm -hmm. I was like, <laughs> oh man, this show gets my sense of humor, <laughs> basically. When I see something that tells me I shouldn't with my own two eyes. Well, you will, Fitz. You will get that opportunity. But I gotta admit, it'd be <laughs> nice to feel nothing right now. You think I don't feel anything? Well, sh there will be a point where she will feel nothing. Mm -hmm. eh, six seasons in the future. <laughs> I'm gonna mine it. Save it. And when we find Ward, I'm gonna use every bit of it to take him down. You know what's really interesting, David, is that this scene right here, we're in the 21st episode of this, the first season. I feel like this is the first, like, real conversation these two have. Yeah. Pretty and much. the first real bonding moment that these two have, you know, like I think this is like a real turning point for these two. Um, took a while, <laughs> but that's what it feels like. Because <clears throat> this this May and, and and Sky feels a lot like what it would be normally mm -hmm. for the rest of the show. And this is like basically like the beginning of their relationship. Yeah, basically, this, yeah. You, they both start training together and all that. I mean, she trains her. Uh, in between season one and season two, she trains Sky into a full-fledged agent, mm -hmm. which is a big jump for her. He's also an international fugitive, accused of a laundry list of crimes. Accused by S.H.I.E.L.D., of whom I've been a vocal critic for years. Now S.H.I.E.L.D.'s gone down in flames. That's pretty convenient, huh? Mm -hmm. The institution falls apart, and it's like, all of a sudden, well, I guess there's nobody left to charge you or prosecute you, so have a nice day. Mm. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> So I'm not sure how interested he'll be in what I found out about Sky. Sky. I probably shouldn't be talking to you about this. I mean, I go straight to Garrett. It's obvious what Raina's doing. I love how <laughs> she's telling you for a reason. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I probably shouldn't be telling you this. Come on. She's telling you so you can tell her. That's why she's. She's instigating this. She wants Sky thinking about this. So she can take her to Kel. Been looking for her parents for a while. It's not exactly a secret. But that's what intrigued me. That and her DNA. Oh, so she had Kel's DNA. And she already knows. It, well, I guess she, she said that it appears to look a lot. Okay, so maybe she doesn't have Kel's DNA. But she can remember what it looked like, I guess. 
and so she can put the pieces together. Did the monsters kill the baby's parents? No. No. That's what's so interesting. The baby's parents were the monsters. That's a twist. That's the first we heard of it on the show. And boy, how truthful was that statement <laughs> mm -hmm. as season two would come into fruition. The baby's parents were the monsters. No, didn't that one guy say it too? He didn't necessarily, he didn't say it in that way. I think he said that, um, the, <sighs> or did he just mention that the monsters were looking for the baby? Yes, that's what he said. Okay. I don't think he put it in the way that the monsters, that the, that the, the, the parents were the monsters. I don't think he put it that way. I'm gonna build a cabin over there. See, I told you you could do it. I know you said that the actor doesn't look like him, but he is doing a good job, though, of, like, trying to portray him, though. I agree with you there. We've yeah. distilled the genetic components of all the previous samples down to one single vial. But it That'll didn't do we move. About. It should regenerate and heal. The other thing about it, mm -hmm. which was, yeah, because I'm not sure, no one even knows at this point, right? So there's no way to look for it. I'm not even sure there's a way to remove it, but, like, you sure you don't want anything else? How about Dr. Radcliffe in a few seasons, he's able to create pterogen crystals where if humans touch them, they're not going to turn into like statues anymore. But with recreating GH325, I don't I don't know if they ever found a way to remove the bad part about it, which was the Kree's memories were in the DNA and implanting themselves on the people who were being injected with it. The only time that ever worked was Tess in season five. Tess was this character in the space station and the lighthouse. She got killed by the Kree, and then they brought her back to life using their their Kree biology, and she was fine. So, just to put that out for the record, in case anyone remembered or forgot. Get out of there right now. Do not engage. Wait for us back at the jump jet. How often do you see a flip phone anymore, by the way? I was like, is Gemma holding a flip phone? <laughs> wow. Long time no see. It's so sad. The, the, the turn, turn of events, but like the two most defenseless people on the team in this season, I should say, ended up being captured by Ward. An EMP. Looks like a joke's on you. First uh, kill attempt from Fitz, which he... The what? First kill attempt from Yeah, yeah, Fitz. yeah, the first, yeah. Oh, wait, no, he shot that one guy. And... Oh, that's true, yeah. Yeah, I forgot. He did kill, he did kill that one guy but, I mean, before. to be fair, self-defense. This one, though, he straight up was like, I'm ready to murder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And to be fair, though, you could argue that Fitz successfully killed Garrett because, I mean... Is Garrett still Garrett with what happens with the once he's injected with the medicine? Is that still Garrett? Mm -hmm. mm. I think the real Garrett dies in this episode because his mind is just completely gone in the next one. So I think Fitz, I think we can count this as a, a kill for Fitz, right? I'll count it. Good. Now take care of Buddy and we'll get out of here. I mean, this is how you know the Hydra are bad guys. Is that they, uh, as part of their initiation, you have to kill a dog. Mm -hmm. I mean, to bring yourself to kill a dog? That, that somehow seems more inhumane than just killing a human. I don't know. It's just like, really? Mm -hmm. But I also love how they, how they took this <laughs> and basically made it a Hydra thing uh, in season five, when they reveal that up and coming Hydra agents have to do that, all Hydra agents had to do that. Go to that same test. I don't know if you can tell, but I think they're gonna use. Yeah, this is actually part of the set for next the next three seasons. <laughs> this is gonna become part of their base. So again, Shield does a lot of uh, redressing sets. So. It's the only thing that's been keeping me alive these past few months. Why isn't it making you strong? I'm too far gone. So, remember, part of that serum 
and he only has this, includes Jaying's biology that he got from Dr. Whitehall, like whatever residue he had left from it. And they were also going to use that exact same serum to keep Coulson alive in season five. Mm -hmm. So just pointing out those connections that we have there. And then I love how we still have this med, uh, this medical pod that we added to the bus in what episode 13 and uh interestingly how they use this for uh this moment i need to understand you need to accept the truth bits he doesn't care about us about anything no i don't believe that we're friends aren't we we've been friends we've had laughs together this really was i think the final like point of no return mm -hmm. for for ward this was the last opportunity where there could have been a redemption. But him doing this, this was the next level. Mm -hmm. And then also, this fits that we're seeing right here, I mean, that's kind of the end for him. Yeah. You know, we have a new fits that takes over. This is the last of the innocence that we have here, and then it all just goes. And to be clear here, why were they flying so low? Garrett gave that order, in case anybody forgot a few minutes ago. He gave that order because they wanted to stay off radar. Oh. So, dang. in case you had that, like, why were they flying that low? That's why they were flying that low. Well, I mean, it also just adds to the fact, like, how they were able to survive the drop. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh, I love this theme. What the hell? Pretty cool, interesting, like, concoction of stuff that he has in. Like, he has Extremis, the Centipede Serum, Jiang's Biology, and then also the GH325 that is also made from Kree Biology. It's, like, really interesting mix of stuff. Mm -hmm. Also, the, the, the cybernetic element as well. The universe. And he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. And he's gone. Yep. <laughs> like, what do you feel? The universe. Okay. <laughs> Quick door. I got this. They're like my thing. I love how Colson, like what secret doors are like my thing. Mm -hmm. I love that. And the base that we will see in the next three seasons. Oh, look at that. Oh, a little bit of a callback. Um, we'll have a, a bunch of secret passageways. Better. Stronger. Faster. Higher, further, faster. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> Reliable security is at an all-time high. It's just a reminder that it's always evil to replace an entire workforce with machines. <laughs> Not that that's relevant in any way whatsoever to today. All right, that was Ragtag Episode 21. I'm going to do things a little bit differently. Uh, I'm not going to read the full reviews, but just um, we're going to save Amwan Medias for the end here. I'm going to go and jump straight into Oliver Sava. Um, he says, This series sure has become a lot of fun since the Hydra reveal. Um, last week's episode featured an action sequence to the flying 1962 Corvette, and this week it has characters using a joy buzzer Joy, Joy Buzzer EMPs and laser cigarettes as they engage in a rogue secret agent mission from a motel room home base. I love that. <laughs> I love how that, that motel room could be considered, a, I guess, an unofficial base for the team there. Combined with the drama introduced by the events of the Winter Soldier, all really Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s forward momentum has made it more enjoyable as a weekly experience. It's a pretty positive uh, comment from somebody who really did not like watching this show. Uh, from the earlier weeks, that's for sure. Uh, he says that Ragtag balances those two elements wonderfully as it sets the stage for the season finale, uh, providing drama via flashbacks to the early years of Ward and Garrett's relationship and amusement through the undercover espionage antics of Coulson's team. While Reyna works to uncover the secret of GH325 for Garrett, Coulson and May go undercover at Cybertech, the tech company behind Project Deathlock to hook up a flash drive that will activate the Trojan horse virus Sky has hid inside the encrypted shield files. Uh, 
he's just pointing out more positive stuff here and trying to read the important parts uh, of the review. Uh, yada, 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 yada. Oh, not, not, that, not that much. Uh, Along with some very nice character moments, May and Sky's conversation about Ward and how to cope with emotional trauma is a highlight. This episode continues to put pieces together to form this season's bigger picture. It's revealed that the reason Garrett is so eager to discover the mysteries of GH-225 is because his cybernetic implants are killing him, and he hopes the alien goo can heal the damage done to his internal organs by the procedure. When Fitz sets off the Joy Buzzer EMP, he causes Garrett's implants to malfunction and forces the man to inject himself with, with the drug, which could be very bad news for Coulson. And then an army of Deathlocks and extremist soldiers. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, and that's it. He gave the episode uh, B+. Plus. Pretty good. <laughs> Next, IGN. Uh, uh, Eric Goldman. The first half of this episode had me concerned. This is the penultimate episode of the season, and the tension should really be at a fever pitch. But the whole trip to Cybertech office slowed things down considerably. Yes, there were reasons within the story that this was meant to be important, but it didn't feel important and had too much of that incredibly jovial, semi-goofy vibe that made a lot of the early episodes feel so overly breezy like nothing was at stake eric i love you man but i don't know what i don't know maybe i don't know eric i feel like your reviews are generally more fair than this i, I don't know maybe you you smoked a little bit too much of like the hate foo that was being spread around about shield in those in those days but i don't know that jovial semi-goofy vibe is part of what makes this show slap so hard let's just be real with you right there it, it is what it is and um I wouldn't have changed it for the world. Like, I, I, I just can't. I just can't. Like, how can you be upset about, like, good vibes? And it's just, it would be one thing if they attempted it and it would be, like, not funny or, like, really awkward tonally. It's not at all. Like, it fits well within what the show is trying to do. And it's really, I mean, the, the file, the large file transfer. Are you kidding me? Are you not going to acknowledge how hilarious that was? Eric continues, it was definitely good to see Garrett and Ward's history through this, though this episode didn't quite nail it as far as showing why Ward was so loyal to Garrett, that he would mercilessly murder people for him. That's true, but I feel like in future episodes, they kind of like really, really reveal how much of a sociopath he is. That's my personal perspective. Yes, Garrett bailed him out of, okay, blah, 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 blah. Still, the ending had a nice back and forth as Ward was given his moment of truth when he was ordered to kill Fitz and Simmons by Garrett and actually went through with it in the end, um, showing he couldn't go through with killing his pal, uh, Buddy the Dog, in those flashbacks. Turned out to only set up how he now had gone much darker, even as those flashbacks then indicated maybe he did kill the dog after. I think, yeah, he did kill the dog. And then they confirmed later on he, he did kill the dog, buddy. R.I.P. buddy. Uh, the reveal that Garrett was the first version of Deathlock was a fun one. In the comics, Garrett is a cyborg, but has no connection to any in, in, in incarnation of Deathlock. Bringing those two elements together makes a lot of sense for this show, rather than have Garrett say, oh yeah, I'm a cyborg too, but that's totally unrelated. I liked it enough that I'll try and overlook the fact that Bill Paxton is, well, a bit heavier than he used to be. <laughs> and he sure doesn't seem to have a smooth metal stomach underneath this shirt. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure what to make with that comment, but okay. Um, uh, and then some other thoughts. That was a nice scene between May and Sky as they spoke about May's history with Ward and how she really feels about what's going on. And her, her plan to basically save all her anger and aim it at Ward. I love how all of the reviewers have noted how how good of a scene that was with May and Sky. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I only just caught it myself. And again, I've rewatched the series so many times, but I think only just now for the first time I'm realizing this might be the first real moment those two have had as characters. Mm -hmm. The first real bonding moment. So that's really interesting to see. Um, okay. Uh... That's it for Eric Goldman. Let's go ahead and queue up our video uh, for Amwan Media's reaction. 
I imagine he let the dog go, you know, as we saw when he was handed the, the, the handgun to do the deed. But then to prove his point, because we saw that scope following the dog, and I don't think that was... That was him. I think that was had to have been Garrett to me, you know, oh. showing him the kind of consequence of not doing that either, which hmm. both regardless of which way that went would be a lesson. Definitely feels like a lesson he would have taught. That being said, though, in season two, they confirmed definitively uh, war did kill him. They do confirm that. But that's an interesting theory. Yeah. He got rid of them. I think he said he get, get rid of them or take care of them or something like that. He wasn't specific. He didn't say kill them. I don't know. He got He's them like, out of there. I, I just, I don't know. Damn it. Fuck. Like, Ward <laughs> owes him his life. So it's not one of these situations where he believes in Hydra. He's following Hydra. He's following Garrett. And Garrett has found value in Hydra. So, like, it's this messy little thing. It doesn't absolve him at all. Of his decisions that he's made, like he said, like Garrett even said, all of this he earned on his own. All these things are his choice at the end of the day. So like, it, you know, he, he, he could have walked away at any point, but he, he feels this, this obligation to the, to, to Garrett for getting him out, getting him out of his situation when he was a kid and giving him these skills and training him up and all these things, regardless of how that all came about. But it seems like there's always that that side of him that's still still in there that he just he's fighting to bury. And we saw some glimmers of it here. But my lord, seriously, look at your surroundings. Look at what you're doing. Look what you're involved in. And does that feel right? And he's still <laughs> here. So that is where it gets not as muddy in the, in in my head. Like I'm still right there, kind of with Sky with May. There's a line. And I think he's very, very much so chosen that line, but Fitz was still holding out that hope because he's an innocent. He's definitely the most innocent. Honestly, I would have argued Sky at that point, but like this really wrecked her. She's definitely riding the, the rage train right now where Fitz is just completely <laughs> in denial. And Simmons is right there with everybody else, you know, following the facts, following the logic and all this. And it's just, it's just unbearable, man. And honestly, uh, Fitz is, and I've even called him that a couple times, man. He's the puppy on the team. <laughs> and he had to put his puppy down. I don't necessarily understand what, as a death as the original death lock in this program, what was the benefits of that? Was it just a, a, a literal torso replacement for the one that he had had blown out? You know, he said he duct taped himself back in. He put his intestines back in and duct taped himself up until he found help and then ended up with this side casing. You know, does it provide any benefits other than keeping his organs in? Because that's where I'm just kind of lost. Is it just cybernetics in general at that point? Like uh, replacements, organ containment. Initially, I think so. But as the time went on they developed a formula to keep him living because the organs were beginning to fail and the mechanics were just fine that's why he needs the serum to survive and he doesn't have those powers because he's too far gone as he says i don't know how many other people in grand total right now but at least like three or four popped up there at the end to jump our gang back in that barber shop as they were trying to find the computer's there so they can upload their uh their 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 flash drive and get that trojan virus that sky put in their system activating that i guess on the flip side of that though we have the bus with fitz and everybody on there with garrett and then with reyna working on this other stuff and also kind of like digging into what sky was looking into and because she's very curious about people with powers you know she would always seek out people with powers that was all what her project centipede was all centered around was trying to replicate that spur that on improve that grow cause the next step in human evolution so to speak but she also implies that she shares similar dna to sky which raises a couple of questions but uh, again she's unlocked at least some part of uh what sky's been hiding not that sky has been purposefully hiding anything she just doesn't know the truth about herself but she's kind of seen these seeds that have been planted that she's in this 084 or something worth keeping an eye on something in particular that she has been studying 
And then in doing that, she found the files and stuff that were kind of sealed off that, that she had found when she was looking into her parents and then discerned and learned and shared with Ward that her parents was part of the kill squad that took out that village, the one where she was at as a baby before S.H.I.E.L.D. could get her away. So that, again, increases the complexity of this puzzle. Like, what was that relationship? Why were they trying to get to this child, their own child, and why do they decimate everything around them? I should remember this, but I don't. But I, I just want to know where that leads. Again, like I said before, one of the only other things outside of this season that I remember is a village. And it does, from what I do remember, have something to do with who or what Sky is. I just want to, I just want us to get to that. I just want to, I'm excited to see that unravel. I'm excited to see that to come to fruition and see if that connects at all with this serum that she's been injected with that has now been injected into Actually, it's like, from what she said, it's a little more purified, refined version of what was given to Coulson, the way she described, the way she recreated it, but the, that she administered just now to Garrett. You know, I, I was hoping for a hot minute because she was hyping it up a little bit. Are you sure you want to do it? It's the last of it. Are you sure? Are you sure? Sure. You know, and I, I thought it was going to be like a fake and she was going to kill him because like she's, he's, while he's been great at helping fund her her resources, her experiments and all this kind of stuff. But she seemed kind of like a little, little peeved that they don't have actual similar worldviews in mind and that this was all about him trying to cheat death. So like that seemed like it bothered her a little bit. So I thought she was probably going to try to kill him or taint that, that, uh, that dosage and take him out that way. Seems like it worked, whatever it was. He was like, I see the universe. Ha! Ah! I don't know. I don't know what it does to him, especially given the fact that he's got, he's pumped full of centipede out. as well. Again, this is something that I, I, I've seen echoed a few times uh, while watching the show and the comments and stuff like that. I, the, the missing of the 20 some episode format, you know, there's a lot of character growth. There's a lot of payoff. Yes. There's a lot that you get to experience throughout all of these er episodes that really sell and make this back half sing because we had all of that time in those earlier yeah. episodes. That said, I highly agree, but there's a counter to that not everyone can is able to write that very well. Like I do like enjoy that format myself in particular, but I've seen shows squander that. I've seen shows meander. I've seen shows not utilize all of those episodes in ways that benefit the story itself or the characters for that matter. This first season has been extremely tight. Everything has mattered in one way or another. All these 22 episodes has all built upon one another. Elements have come back. Characters have come back. Storylines have come back. There are callbacks to conversations with different characters. Relationships have evolved and grown. I have not seen a season at this length and marry all this together this well. So it is kind of, it is this isolated case in a way, at least in my experience from the shows that I've seen, which is mostly within this sphere, this genre and all this kind of stuff around the same time that this was going on. You know, it is pretty damn strong. The only one I would kind of say had a pretty solid comparison might be Arrow season one, Flash season one. A lot of them really struggled to maintain that format and Flash, I think, took the largest hit. And then you have the other shows that just never really locked it in. And a lot of those also just had straight up standalone episodes. When you look at the grand scheme of this season as a whole, there's not really a standalone episode. Like everyone served a purpose, whether or not it's for the story, it's for the character and how that will then fuel that character's decision in a later episode. Like even what feels like a standalone episode really isn't, and you don't see that. You, you definitely don't see that a lot at all. Again, I think Arrow season one is the only example of that I could even think of within the Arrowverse that did that. Every one of those was furthering that tale, that narrative, that mission. So like, it's, it's interesting to me to see like this show have just such a strong hold on this format. That said, speaking of one relationship that really shined through in this one and really got me uh, tearing up a little bit was again, 
May, like especially considering where Sky and her started off on kind of yeah. the wrong foot. You know, May wasn't sure she should be here at all. She very much contested it. But over time, Sky earned her trust, earned her faith, and then through all of that, you know, there's this perception of May where we as the viewer, we've seen her be vulnerable. We've seen that side of her where she feels things. Sky necessarily has never seen that. And this in this moment where they had that little that exchange in the motel room, we get to kind of see that that those walls come down a little bit, that they're both feeling the same thing right now. The playing field has been leveled for the two of them. This betrayal hurts all of them just as much, no matter how much May controls herself or doesn't let it show. She's never not feeling any of those things. You know, a great example of that, again, something that hasn't necessarily been shared with the team, but we, we know it as the viewer, she still carries around that pain from the event that set her on this path. Like Colson said, she didn't always used to be this way, you know, but that event in the past really messed her up, but she's not the type of person to be numb. She wants to feel that she feels that because she feels things so strongly. She still carries that guilt, that weight, that pain. She doesn't let it show, but she also will not forget it. You know, there was that conversation about whether or not, you know, you let something go or you, you forget it or you hold on to it. And she's the one to hold on to it because that pain is a part of her. And denying that would be a disservice to the people that sacrifice their lives in that situation. But on top of that, you know, she can utilize those emotions that she buries into her when she needs to, to fuel it into the mission, to put it into what they're going after, to fuel her drive, especially anger. The anger she's feeling right now, like Sky said, she doesn't necessarily have her set of skills. She doesn't have a way to channel that anger necessarily as just this hacker. But like May came in there to back her up with that. I was like, hey, she's gonna seems like she's gonna take over Ward's little training sessions. She for will. Every, day. every morning I'm up doing my thing. You're welcome to join me. It's just such a great little character moment, man. But guys, with all that said, I'm excited to see how. Yeah basically sums it up pretty well um david anything to add as far as this episode is concerned um uh, no um i'm the one like nailed it <laughs> the, like, <laughs> basically right that was <laughs> setting up uh this whole season you know kind of culminated into this episode almost uh i mean there's still some things to go over obviously basically just the end <laughs> we know it's going to be the end of the next episode and all that but yeah everything that's kind of happened all um come up to this episode so yeah like i said everything he's just said here was uh, like he nailed it on the head mm -hmm. and uh, yeah it's almost like he did the talking for us yeah also <laughs> i just see he did reactions to superman and lois i think i might watch those <laughs> go watch them go watch them i mean like i don't know if you i mean we only watch his like his review of the episode but his reactions of the shield episodes they're pretty cool too. I mean, they're I love I watch them. He's got a lot of reactions. I was actually just watching a, a reaction to Furiosa mm -hmm. of his. Uh, he, he does a, a couple of movie reactions. He actually I think he reacted to the whole Mad Max universe. That's cool. Uh, but yeah, like, and he he loves superhero content. Obviously, we talked about Arrow and the Flash, and so he might have a lot of those as well. Mm -hmm. But really interesting how he compared uh, the strength, complimentary anyway. Uh, he compared the strength of this first season to that of Arrow season one and, and the Flash season one, which I think I haven't seen Flash season one. I haven't seen Arrow season one, but I know that people love those shows in large part because of how strong those first those first seasons were of those shows. But then, of course, they all caught CW-itis. And then as the year, they had too many seasons and they had too many episodes. And then it just kind of fell off from what you tell me and from what I heard from other people who watch the shows. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to go ahead and end it off here today. Thank you all for watching. Uh, we apologize if this is an extremely long episode and we had that woke conversation at the beginning of the episode. Whatever. Look, we all are very appreciative of you being here and watching and uh, enjoying this very special show of ours. Uh, with us 
And stay tuned. Of course, we've got some more reactions of S.H.I.E.L.D. coming. We also got some other content that may be coming in the future that may be to your fancy. Who knows? Anyway, stay under our red spotlight for more content and more. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.